you mentioned something, and I will just uh, in the setup for you to read it, read the um, dedication for my great friend Mitsugi Nakamura of Kyoto, Japan. Right. Which is going to be relevant here. Right? Yes. So apparently the story, um, Dr. Seuss was uh, demonstrably uh, anti-Japanese and in a way that was perfectly mundane uh, in the run-up to uh, our entry into the war. Um, but in any case, he made cartoons. I'll actually, Zach, do you have um, the you have that uh, fifth column cartoon? Let's see what you got. Yeah, perfect. Um, so this is um, a, a this is proceeding from this uh, anti-Japanese trope of basically uh japanese americans as a fifth column hmm. and they are is there, so it says i can't quite read it it says waiting for the signal from home uh yeah i think that's right okay uh, anyway the japanese so this characters, is presumably this is from during the war or before the war yeah i think this yeah. is uh just prior this is this is before uh the internment camps i believe yeah, so that's certainly unfortunate yeah it's, it's unfortunate. unfortunate it's it's you know patently racist well, it's patently racist, again, in a exactly way. Exactly of the moment. Yes. The country yeah. was racist enough to corral its own citizens and, and, and violate on, their rights. And depending on when it happened, it was literally during a world war in which, um, you know, in which this was the enemy. Right. So, I'm not excusing well, it, this but wasn't the enemy. These are, these are Japanese Americans, but yes. where Japanese, Japanese people were the enemy. Yeah. And so, okay, there's racism in this, to be sure. Um, but it is... Uh, Anyway, it is a measure of his mindset, which would have been perfectly in keeping with many people. But so after the war, he apparently went to Japan and had a, an awakening experience. Mm -hmm. The dedication of that book reveals it. He made friends in Japan. Mm -hmm. And Horton Hears a Who. And he was in Kyoto. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah. he, Horton Hears a Who is, the, is basically his encoding of the lesson that he had learned from his bigoted mindset mm -hmm. to his egalitarian mindset. It is his encoding of that lesson in a book for children. And so, yeah. you know, A plus, right? right? Yeah. I don't know that you necessarily get an A plus for just simply never having had the bigotry if you just simply grew up in a situation that didn't create it. But to get over the bigotry, actually, that does take something. We have the before and after. You just showed a before. And we have in his oeuvre, Horton Hears a Who, and so much else right. that demonstrates the the growth that is possible for individuals. And that he encodes it in a way that isn't, you know, it's not an apology exactly. It's far better than an apology. It's mm -hmm. a corrective for future bigotry yeah. that, you know, he's giving to children, right? right? Which is, you know, it is an amazing fact. and um, Maybe the world's most impactful educator. Could well be, mm -hmm. could uh, and it's almost impossible to measure because the lessons are encapsulated in such a way that when they unfold, you don't even realize where they came from. Yeah, that's right. Um, one of the one of the canceled books, Miguel gets pool. Um, to me, I just uh, I'll, here. Let me let me see if I can show it here. Um, I have the yep. I also have. Um, except I can't get to the beginning of the book. Yeah, here is the uh, image that got McGilligot's pool canceled. So this is a story. I think most of us did not know this story until it uh, was um, canceled. Um, Be can we, before we talk about that image, just set it up? Sure. Um, so Zach, if you can show my screen here. Um, this, is, this is the cover of the book, and it starts... Um, with a little boy fishing in a pool that the farmer says it's too the pool is too small and you might as well know it when people have junk here's the place that they throw it and the boy says hmm answered marco it may be you're right i've been here three hours without one single bite there might be no fish but again well there might because you never can tell what goes on down below the pool might be bigger than you or i know there might be a, this might be a pool like i've read of in books co uh connected to one of those underground brooks Okay, so it goes on and on and on and on, and then we get to, Zach, you can show back, yep. We get to uh, this image where, I can't quite read it, it says, some Eskimo fish from beyond Hudson Bay might 
Decide to, to swim, swim down. Yeah, can you? Yeah, my decide to swim down might be headed this way. It's a pretty long trip, but they might, and they may. So. I actually did have this as a child as well. You did? I don't, I now that I see it, I remember it. Unfortunately, it's not in our collection, but. But in any case, obviously, the t- term Eskimo is incorrect and offensive in many contexts. Um, I would point out that. This is not that, that itself is going to be news to a lot of people, right? And you know, are you know, is, are the Beatles next? When Quinn the Eskimo gets here, everybody's going to flock to him. Um, I don't so run I, to him. I don't know that reference. Let's just put it this way. So this, you're saying that there's a Beatles song which uses the word Eskimo, and if Eskimo is if if, if an image of fur-necked fish being called Eskimo fish in a Seuss book is sufficient to have the publisher of that book say, actually, we're going to pull this because it's not reflective of our values, then, you know, what's next? Perhaps the Beatles, because they also use the word Eskimo. Right. And, you know, we will find that because of human nature, this is a problem that is riddled throughout lots of things. So, for example, I hope I'm remembering this correctly, the term Anastasi is actually Anasazi. Anasazi is an epithet. It is not the term that the people in question use for themselves. Um, it is basically the, the Navajo word for foe. Um, I believe that's right. There and so, then there's so uh, Pueblo people. The yeah. Pueblo people, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's the most complex case of all, I think, which is the term Indian, which is obviously, you know, Columbus's error, mm-hmm. thinking that he was, you know in India or had arrived at where he was intending to go, misjudges, therefore, the people he's encountered. Those people have now taken on this moniker. And some people, in fact, I've been challenged inside of Clubhouse for using the term Indian as if it was an epithet, which it isn't. Indians use it for themselves. I have specifically been instructed by uh, people of native descent. We had a colleague at Evergreen who insisted on it, who actually got, you know, pretty pissed off at um, all this futzing around with all this other language. He said, call me an Indian and let's get on with it. <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's not, again, it's not the most interesting thing about me. Right. You know, was his, was his position. And um, it's true and it is present in everything that I do and everything that I am. Uh, but spending a lot of time around exactly what language to use is a waste of all of our time. Right. And, you know, the, my feeling is people have a right to self-define and, you know, to the extent that we have a major, you know, uh, news outlet for Native Americans called Indian country. This is something that has been mm-hmm. chosen by people. They've taken it on. Um, you know, and what are we to do, frankly, with white and black? I've never met a black, black person or a white, white person. I've met some pink white people and I've met some brown black people. But the point is, these are not literal descriptions of anything. These are somebody's moniker, right? Mm-hmm. And so the the whole thing is fraught and we can either get over it and say, all right, look, history is definitely not a pretty place. It's got its moments, both good and bad. And let us not read too much into the particular utterances that we are using or the particular choice of, yeah. you know, tropes that have show up in a child's book. There's, um, there's something very interesting to be done here, I think, around <clears throat> what what language is, <clears throat> is a move away from strictly onomatopoetic utterances in which, <clears throat> excuse me, um, onomatopoeia being uh, those words that sound like what they're describing. Um, so, you know, the names that we give to animal sounds, um, interesting though that they often sound so different between different um, languages, even though the animals presumably sound the same. Um, But other words like crash or bonk. Splash. Splash, right. Um, And that one of the things that linguists describe as an indication that that you're engaged in language um, that is more complex is that it's, it is much, it goes far beyond simple onomatopoeia. And that, you know, things that sound like what they the things they're describing is a very narrow version that is what onomatopoeia is. But you're talking now about like visual descriptors being exactly the thing that the word is being used to mean. It's like, it's like a visual onomatopoeia that we are stuck in. And what language is, 
is metaphor. Like so, so much of the meaning in language is actually metaphorical. That you know the and you know and we get ambiguity and you know nuance can be ambiguous and language is almost always ambiguous and you can disagree about exactly what you meant by a, a certain word um, unless it is nailed down at sort of the you know visual or you know sensory onomatopoetic level. But um, to be nailed down to that level is again an example of reductionist thinking. Is a you know is it's just so narrow and so it's all trees and no forest uh, that we're never going to get anywhere interesting or good. And you know it gets in the way of the purpose of language. The purpose right. of language is to convey things, and so it just so happens that if you go to Lone Pine, California, you won't find the Lone Pine. It fell down a long time ago, right? Now, it happens that nobody is offended that we call it Lone Pine, and there's been no movement to... You know why? Because Lorax, no one speaks for the trees, Brett. <laughs> I don't think that's why. <laughs> I think it's because Lone Pine has now taken on a meaning that has nothing to do with a Lone Pine, right? Um, no, now, but this, I mean, this is an excellent example, I think. Um, there, you know, all of those place names that are indicative of a particular thing from a particular place in a particular time, you know, they don't all need to be to be kept. They don't all need to be kept, but a widespread uh, though of a moment, we're going to rename all the things. Well, we're going to we're going to stop publication of all of these things, and we're going to rename all these other things. Man, the school renamings are amazing. There's there's no consideration of the cost benefit in any case, right. and so Lone Pine is relatively simple because the cost of just simply accepting that it doesn't describe an actual tree pretty low. On the other hand, Dead Indian Memorial Drive in Southern Oregon, mm. right? Now, that always, from the first moment I heard that descriptor, struck me as callous, mm -hmm. right? Dead Indian, right? Who was this? What are the circumstances of their death, right? right. Um, and, you know, but the problem is, if you rename it, nobody knows how to ask directions, because that's simply what everybody understands it to be called. A worse case, um, I remember from when I was working with Bob Trivers in Jamaica as his field assistant, um, we drove through a town called Black River. Mm -hmm. And I asked him very naively, I looked at it, I said, that river looks brown to me. It was just, it was a silty mm -hmm. river. And he said, it's not named for the water. It's named for the people, right? Oh, goodness, right? This was a descriptor of the population that lived around that. Aren't Aren't most people who live in Jamaica? Yeah, but African it was a, it was a British origin? naming. So I, I, I guess I'm just I I haven't been to Jamaica. You had that one one extended experience in the field with Bob many many years ago. Um, that just surprises me because it seems like those people who don't have dark skin who live in Jamaica are a tiny minority. Well, I don't know what the uh, I don't know what the meaning is um, yeah. precisely, but nonetheless, it's sure to be uncomfortable given that a place was named for the color of the skin. And then you yeah. and I ran into an odd example of this in, um, uh, where were we? Uh, uh, the slave market in... Uh, oh, Charleston. Yeah, in Charleston. Mm -hmm. South Carolina. Right. So the slave market gives the impression that this is the place where slaves were sold, when in fact what slave market means, so there's a correct meaning to it, which is mm -hmm. historically accurate, which is that this is the place where slaves went to sell their goods, that they actually had an economy that they could sell things at the place. Hmm. Um, well, I don't remember this. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, the point, I guess, is, look, if you want to just scrutinize the name of every damn thing, right. wow, are you going to find a mess? And is some of it going to be offensive? You better believe some of it's going to be offensive. Um, yeah. Is that an argument to change every offensive thing? Well, at least you would want to figure out how much chaos you're going to create by taking things, the names of which people know, and invalidating those names. <laughs> <laughs>